Let me give you the first, the, 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 the simplest model of comparative advantage that you can think about. Think about a world where there are two, there are two, two skills, for example. This is, this is like XA, that's how good I, or let me call it, yeah, that's fine. Or HA, that's my human capital at task A. And HB, which is my human capital at task B. So those are a measure of how good I am at two tasks, okay? And say there are two jobs in the economy. And WA is the wage you get paid per unit of skill on task A. And WB is the wage you get paid per unit skill on task B, right? So if you have twice as much a, HA as somebody else, you get paid twice as much. That's Think about that as like defining the units of HA, right? HA is defined to basically be proportional to your ability in that, in that sector. So then your income in A would be WAHA, and your income in B would be WBHB, right? That would be your, your earnings. If you work in A, you get WAHA, and if you work in B, you get WBHB. And if people are sorting themselves according to comparative advantage, you would say Y would be the max of WAHA, WBHB, right? That would, be, that would be how much you earn in equilibrium would be the maximum of the two, right? So. What does that mean is you pick A if HA over WA is bigger than WBHB, which is the same as saying HA over HB is bigger than WB over WA, right? So Basically, that's the notion of comparative advantage. It doesn't matter how big my H's are, it's just the ratio. That's the first idea of comparative advantage. So in this picture, that looks like a line. This is HA over HB equals WB over WA, right? So that that's the, that's the split. That's the equilibrium. So guys on that line are indifferent. Everybody over here, you pick A. And everybody over here picks B, right? Everybody understand how the equilibrium is going to look? Everybody who's got more HA relative to HB, that's the people below this line, choose A. Everybody above this line chooses B, right? And you can think about how the equilibrium is determined there's some underlying demand for A and B. If there's a lot of demand for people to do A and not much demand for people to do B, then WA, right, it, this line's going to rotate up like this, and it's going to move a bunch of people into A, right? This line's going to be, be very steep in that case, okay? And if there's a lot of demand for people in B, it'll be over here. So this line is determined in equilibrium by getting enough people on each side of the line. And the supply and demand works the way you would think. If you have too few people in A, you raise WA relative to WB. That shifts this line up like that and brings more people into A and fewer people into B until you get to equilibrium. Right? So that's kind of how that that's kind of how a comparative advantage model would work. Okay, that's what that's what I want to talk about now. Okay, so we just we haven't well, this is the setup. Like right? this is like you know like this is like the, what do they call it in acting or whatever. This is like the beginning. We're just or like this is like the, just setting up the joke, right? We're gonna like we're gonna this is just the lead in, right? We haven't got to the funny part yet. Okay, so all right. So now let's think about what the world looks like in that equilibrium, right? So in that equilibrium. H A H B, and assume we've achieved this equilibrium. All right. Now, in that equilibrium, what do people's indifference curves over skills look like? What sets of skills am I indifferent over? Well, all the guys that make the same income looks like that. That is, everybody along that line makes the same 
income because this guy here earns the same no matter where he goes, but he has just as much A as anybody along this line who earns just as much as he does working A. So these guys e have equal income, all these people here. Okay? So now let's think about you get to choose your skills. Okay? You get to choose your skills. And let's assume the set from which I get to choose my skills looks like this. Now you might say that's a weird looking picture, but it's easy to motivate a picture that looks like this. Let's just say it looked like that. I get to choose my skills from some opportunity set that looks like that. You don't like my opportunity set? What do you think it should look like? Let me, tell me if you don't like this one. Tell me what you might think would be a better opportunity set. You might say, well, why doesn't it look like this? Right? Why doesn't it like isn't it more why isn't it more like a standard production possibility frontier? And the answer is, well, think of this as like my skills as a carpenter, and this is my skills as a plumber, right? This is plumbing and this is carpentry. Well, being this is like the best carpet best plumber I can be, but the skills I need to be the best possible plumber doesn't mean I'm the worst possible carpenter. There's some skills that are kind of common to those two activities. So, you know, it's, it, there's, there's, there's kind of like, even the guy who only focused on being the best plumber possible would end up with a positive amount of skills as a carpenter, right? This part of the production opportunity set you really can erase, right? This is like the non, what we call the non-economic part of the opportunity. Nobody's ever going to choose those points, right? Nobody's going to go past there. It's like I'm getting worse at both, right? Nobody's going to go. So the only economic part is like this part, okay? But if you had this production possibility frontier and this ISO income curve, where would people choose? Well, they would have to be choosing, if everybody was identical, they would all be choosing these two points. They would all choose the points at the extremes because if I'm going to be a carpenter, I should be the best carpenter I can be. And if I'm going to be a plumber, I'm going to be the best plumber I can be. Right? The worst thing I can be is equally good at both. That's kind of like the dumbest choice, right? The dumbest choice is to be right here. Because if I was a better carpenter, I could earn more as a carpenter. If I was a better plumber, I could earn more as a plumber. The worst possible thing is be the guy who's exactly indifferent between the two. So that means that even if people could choose to have no comparative advantage in the economic sense, you wouldn't expect that to be the equilibrium. You'd expect the equilibrium to be that people specialize. Right? It's like I should decide. I'm either going to be a plumber, then I'll be the best plumber I can be. If I'm going to be a carpenter, I'll be the best carpenter I can be. The worst thing I can be is indifferent. Because if I had any more of either skill, I'd be better off. Okay? That's like a real simple model. Now, you can get people to choose the middle point by bringing in some uncertainty, and then people have some incentive to kind of like have an option. But you can't usually be able to get all the people to choose there. But that's more complicated. We can't get into all of that. But that's kind of the idea when I meant that it was endogenous. That you know, comparative advantage, in the case of things like oil or agriculture, you might think of an exogenous characteristic of the land. But most of the comparative advantage we think about, it, like in the labor market, is acquired comparative advantage. People train themselves to do X, they can train themselves to do Y, and they acquire a comparative advantage. The point here is, in equilibrium, people in general are going to have an incentive to acquire a comparative advantage. They're not going to want to be equally good at equally good in quotes in the sense of earning the same amount at everything. That's rarely going to be the right decision. Because if I was equally good at everything, I'd be better off being a little better at one of them. Everybody understands that? Yeah. Right. Now, the point is, let's assume now that not everybody has the same frontier, that some guys have slightly different frontiers. But what that's going to mean is they're not going to end up slightly different. The guy who's slightly better at investing in A, in A is going to do lots of A. 
And the guy who's slightly better at doing B is going to do lots of B. So those initial differences could be extremely slight. But people are going to sort themselves out so that ultimately there's a much greater comparative advantage than any innate comparative advantage. Right? Here, I've generated a world where there's no innate comparative advantage and you get this huge comparative advantage in equilibrium. But if you switched it a little and said some guys are a little innately better at A and some guys are a little innately better at B, they would end up not a little better, they would end up a lot better in whatever they chose. Yeah, this is, this is kind of the idea. So this is, this is kind of the picture. So I think it's a, it's a great question. I mean, it really, and it's reason why we would expect in the labor market to see this kind of switch. It also introduces a really interesting, well, I got to get back to the lecture. I mean, but if I got time, I'm going to try to do a lecture on human capital. When I come back to human capital, I'll talk about some of this stuff because there's a lot of interesting things. My, my plan is to, like, right at the end of the quarter, do some stuff on human capital. I'll try to talk about some of the inequality stuff I talked about last Friday. I'll also try to talk more about human capital just in general because it's an incredibly important part. Of, of, of the world, okay?